was in the beginning of his life a poor man, orphaned from a father, starving for bread, no shoes, torn clothes, no work, seeing his family starving. And then in a few short years, the whole world became a red carpet for him, the East and the West. And a red carpet not for him to glorify himself, but to bring to people the glory of spirituality. As you see the title, this is a lecture of Vivekananda. You see, we all have inside this deep wish to live out a purpose, to live a um, glorious, meaningful life. But when we look around, it's hard to find examples. Some people did some things and they were amazing in this and amazing in that and not so amazing in other things. Or they had a lot of good intention but didn't accomplish much. Or they accomplished a lot but impure morally. Vivekananda is an example of a perfectly accomplished spiritual mission. If there was a spiritual dictionary, maybe you consider to write it, now you can have one value. A perfectly accomplished spiritual mission, you can put the life story of Vivekananda as an example. Extraordinary, and I hope through this lecture, extracting just the essence of his life and mission, we can see its perfection. Today, 2020-something, yoga, spirituality, meditation, Buddhism, Indian philosophy, live the moment, be happy, transcendence, enlightenment, they are a part of the West. It's a part of our talks. I mean, you could... My grandmother, God rest her soul, when we came with the, the flyers of Tantra workshop, she looked at Tantra and she said, why do you say Tantra and not Mantra? So it is something that is, is common. Yeah, even grandmothers know of mantras and of enlightenment and, and stuff like that. But uh, it wasn't like this in the 18th or 17th century. And if we look at a moment in which the wisdom of the East expanded, or let's say was bridged, arrived at the West, in my humble opinion, it is the moment when Vivekananda arrived and started speaking in America and then in Europe. He was, um, as we will see in the beginning of his life, a poor man, orphaned from a father, starving for bread, no shoes, torn clothes, no work, seeing his family starving, no hope no faith. And then in a few short years, the whole world became a red carpet for him, the East and the West. And a red carpet not for him to glorify himself, but to bring to people the glory of spirituality. Now we will dive into his life. He was born, like many other great saints, uh, in a very auspicious environment. His mother, Bhuvaneshwari Devi, was praying to Lord Shiva for a boy. She was praying very earnestly in the temple and a vision arrived in which Lord Shiva said, yes, I will be born in your womb. And so in January 1863, Vivekananda is born in Calcutta as Narendranath. He is an extraordinary child, total genius and leader in school. He is meditating from a very young age. You can see there he was uh, meditating with his friends and a cobra entered the room and stayed very close to him. The friends ran away. They shout, Narendra, Narendra, Narendra. <laughs> he is meditating. 
and the snake stayed close to him and then left and nothing happened, he already at a very young age entered so deep in meditation he would lose the outer world and what is called perfect pratyahara. He will arrive to his master later on and his master would ask him in their first visit, do you see a light when you close your eyes? And he's like, yeah. And do you see a light when you fall asleep? He's like, yeah, but isn't not all people see a light? He says, no, <laughs> you see a light. And he reports that since he was a child, he would close his eyes and see a light. And when he would go to sleep, he would see that light. The light would become a ball. The ball would expand and pulsate and pulsate and pulsate. He would leave his body into this pulsating wonderful light and fall asleep. And he thought, this is falling asleep. <laughs> he didn't uh, realize that already at a young age he had an immense spirit, an immense spiritual power in him. When a uh, sadhu, a monk, which are very often beggars in India, would come to their door, he would shower them and give everything in the house. So he, the parents, when a sadhu, when a monk would come, they would lock him in his room because he would just give everything. So he found a way to give to the monks through the window. <laughs> he would call and give whatever belongings were there in the house. He was extremely devoted to spirituality already at a very young age. Now, Vivekananda had an exceptional memory and an exceptional reading capacity. He would basically remember everything he read. He read the entire Encyclopedia Britannica. It's probably one of the first volumes because it's the 19th century. And he memorized all of it. And then he realized that he doesn't need to read the whole thing. If, if he reads one sentence in the beginning of the paragraph and one in the end, he has all the information. And he developed that skill that he could read the first and last sentence of every page. And he knew by heart everything that's written there. And everyone who met him, and he was, as we will see, met by the greatest people of the generation of his time, were at all at his knowledge. He has his first state of spiritual ecstasies as a teenager, but he's not sure if there is a God. He has visions of the Buddha and he's saying maybe there is nothingness. He has some faith in God and no. He studies Berkeley and um, Western philosophy and he finds contradictions in the scriptures. He says Moses writes the Bible and he writes about his own death. It doesn't make sense. The Mahanirvana Tantra has so and so contradictions. The Westerners, their philosophy is logical, is perfect. So he's in a pickle. He goes and he tries to find out. He's a kind of super faithful agnostic in that stage. He has to find out if there is a God, but he's not willing to take anyone's authority. He wants to know for sure himself. So he joins the Brahmo Samaj, a kind of reformed Hinduism that believes, very westernized, that believes in a formless God with attributes and rejects the worships of the statues, of the images, of the gods and goddesses in their multiplicity. Somehow trying to bridge the one God of the West, the rationalism of the West, with the concept of Brahman, Parama Shiva, Parama Brahma, Parama Vishnu, the Absolute in the Hindu tradition. Somehow trying to adapt to the English way of thinking and still respecting their old scriptures. And they, they found a way, focus on the scriptures, to find a kind of non-superstitious way of worship. So he likes that. He, he joins the organization. He goes from master to master. And he says, what's your views? And the master explains, says, well, sounds amazing, but have you seen God? And the master says, no. Well, then I go to the next one. Now, the head of the Brahmo Samaj, Keshab Singh, who was a, a great saintly and worldly being, he would even met the Queen of England, he did a lot of projects. 
he meets the great Ramakrishna, who is then a beggar priest, total nobody. And he says, well, why don't you join me and follow me in the Brahma Samaj? And Ramakrishna is like, no, I'm doing my thing here. And in time, as they get to know each other, Keshab Singh, who is rich and famous and all worships by thousands and tens of thousands of people, understands that Ramakrishna is a genuine master. And he, who was himself considered a master, has the humility and the greatness of spirit to become a disciple of this master in rags. And so Vivekananda, following his teacher, Kesha, who was the teacher of the Brahma Samaj, goes to meet Ramakrishna. And he sees Ramakrishna and he says, Sir, have you seen God? And he says, Yes. And Vivekananda is like, Okay, finally. He says, Yes, I see God. I see Him now. I see Him like I see you, but with much greater clarity. But who cares about God? People cry for money. People cry for pain. People cry for relationship. Nobody cries because they miss God. And Vivekananda is intrigued. In their second meeting, Vivekananda goes to the temple where Ramakrishna is. And Ramakrishna takes him to the side and he says, What has taken you so long? Now, Ramakrishna is a 40-something-year-old master. You see him there in the back with a beard. Well respected, very emotional, very devotional. And Vivekananda is 18 or 19, very firm, very manly, very mental. And he's looking at this old man, who, who he doesn't know, and the old man takes him outside of the room and speaks to him in four eyes with tears and says, I missed you. What took you so long to come to me? I can't stand these people. They just speak about money and worldly things. Finally, you arrived to me, you arrived to me. And he calls him Naren Naren. Which his name is Narendra, it's pretty close, but it's not his name. And Vivekananda says, okay, the man says he sees God, but he's also a bit cuckoo. But I gotta be respectful, let's check this out. So he's kind of, you know, swallowing a frog there and saying, yeah, yeah, sure, I, I missed you too. Okay, they go back in the room, and Ramakrishna, like Ramakrishna, puts his foot on Vivekananda's chest. It was a classic Ramakrishna move. It was not like uh, something extraordinary. Ramakrishna would put his foot on people in order to put them in samadhi. So, in the Indian tradition, the grace of the Guru appears from his two hands, from his two feet, two eyes, and from his mind. This is why they touch the feet. Yeah, they don't touch the knee or the elbow of the, the guru or vertebra L5. Yeah? They touch the feet because from there the grace of the guru pours. So Ramakrishna stands up and pushes his, push, his foot in Vivekananda's chest. Vivekananda describes that the whole world was collapsing. There was like a sucking power. Everything was disappearing. He lost the feeling of his body. He lost the feeling of the universe. And he was scared. He was really, really scared. So he shouts out, Don't you know I have a mother and a father? And Ramakrishna said, Okay, some other time. Some other time. No need to rush. He takes his foot down. And Vivekananda, or Narendra, in that time, slowly comes back. In their third vi visit, Ramakrishna is uh, somehow taking it middle way and not putting Vivekananda in a total samadhi, but yet he touches him softly and he puts him in an elevated state of consciousness. Still, Vivekananda could handle it then. And then Vivekananda enters a state of trance in which he remembers his real identity. And we'll speak about this in a moment. And Ramakrishna asks him, So, how is it going? How has it been? How long will you stay on this earth? Your mission is so-and-so, isn't it? Okay, you do like this, you do like that. They have a talk from the level. There is a master in Narendra already. And Ramakrishna has an update talk with the master. Getting an update and giving an update. And he touches him and puts him in that state. And then he takes his hand down. 
Narendra Nath comes back to, to the ordinary plane and Ramakrishna is satisfied. Everything is confirmed. This is the right person. This is the mission. Everything is fine. Now Ramakrishna tells the others, as soon as Narendra Nath knows who he is, he will die. Once he realizes what a great spirit he is, he will not stay on this world for too long. He will close his eyes and enter Mahasamadhi, as it is called, when the great saints leave their body and return to God. Ramakrishna would see visions of his students. He would see visions of Rakal and of others. He saw visions of Keshav Seng before the students would appear, sometimes years, sometimes decades. When it was time for him to teach, when Ramakrishna was ready to teach, he finished his great sadhana and attained God through Islam, through Christianity, through Vedanta, through Tantra, through Kundalini, through Bhakti Yoga, Jnana Yoga, adoration of Vishnu, adoration of Krishna, you name it, adoration of Kali, of the Divine Mother, you name it, he did it, he perfected in it, and he attained enlightenment in all these paths. It took him a few decades. But when he was accomplished, he would sit on the roof and cry, and he says, Mother, where are my children? God, which she was, for him was Mother, Kali, where are my children? And then he would start to see visions of his future children. He saw visions of Narendra, of Vivekananda, and the vision was the following. For me, this is one of the most uh, touching visions I've ever heard. Ramakrishna goes in Samadhi. And as he goes in Samadhi, he says, I started to go up and up and up and up, higher and higher and higher, beyond the physical plane, into all the paradises, the astral world, going higher and higher, and then to the world of gods, the causal world, seeing all these mighty, tremendous beings, and then from there, above, higher and higher and higher, and I reached the line. And that line was the line separating the absolute from relativity. And my consciousness soared beyond that limit, and I entered the absolute. This is, um, <clears throat> let's say, to use the word common, maybe a bit much said, but in states of samadhi, this limit and this rising of the three worlds and then this ultimate light of the Absolute is something that repeats in many visions, in many traditions. He enters the Absolute. And then in the Absolute, he sees a few of the Rishis. The Rishis are the ancient sages of India, who he realized then they are above even the gods in their power, in their total surrender to God, in their wisdom, in their understanding, and in their love. And from the space of the Absolute itself, the light was condensed into a baby, into a divine child. And the divine child was floating there and looking at one of these rishis, at Naran, who is an incarnation of Narayana, or Vishnu, and who was once Arjuna in the Krishna story. And he looks at him and he says, I'm going down, you come? And the Rishi opened his eyes and silently, without making much of a gesture, did a little kind of yes. And so they came down. And that divine baby is no different than Ramakrishna, who is a manifestation of the Absolute. And that great Rishi is his disciple to fulfill his mission. They had a kind of a joint mission, the father and son mission. <laughs> Ramakrishna and Vivekananda, father and son, spiritual mission, cooperation or something. They came down together. Ramakrishna gets another vision of Narendra and he says, oh, no, 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 he's too spiritual. He sees him already alive before he meets him. He says, no, 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 he's too spiritual. He will lose his body. He will enter Samadhi and never return. And he prays to Kali. He says, entangle him in Maya. So he forgets a bit. 
You have to drop his level of consciousness, make his life a bit complicated. Otherwise, he will be gone before we meet. Hey guys, if you like this video, make sure to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more content on spirituality, tantra and more. And if you want to sign up for our online classes or for our retreats, you can see our website on the description below.